Well, good morning to all of you. <laughs> I can't resist starting my remarks this morning with that image that kids grow up with today, but I was a kid still when that view of Earth was off in the distance somewhere. But I still look at it with that sense of amazement that there we are, that little blue speck in a universe of unfriendly options. Maybe they're not options at all, but at least they're unfriendly. We know that. That to live on Mars or the Moon or any other place would take a lot of doing on our part, even to set up housekeeping for a few of us for a short period of time. So I think it's one of the greatest images ever made, the, well, series of images of Earth from space to give us a better perspective on who we are, where we've come from, or maybe even where we might be going. Early in the 20th, 21st century, we are the beneficiaries of all that has gone before. The kids of today, and a lot of grown-ups too, sometimes express a very strong sense of uh, discouragement, panic even, looking around with all of the problems that face us as never before. You know? We're able to kill things, including one another, with powers that did not exist a thousand years ago or even a hundred years ago. But we're also empowered with knowing things that we could not know at any time prior to the present. Things that the smartest people who ever lived in times past could not know because we had not gathered the data, did not have the evidence, did not have satellites in the sky or submersibles deep in the sea or the ability to communicate globally in an instant. We have the best chance of any who have ever lived to figure out that big question, where are we going? And even more importantly, how are we going to get to wherever that magical place is? Because we can see our impact on that little blue speck in the universe. We can see it. We can measure it. We can look at the Arctic ice and the ice in Antarctic waters and see, measure, document, show the evidence of what we're putting into the atmosphere and how it affects everything. What we're putting into the ocean and how that affects everything, including, of course, us. What we're taking out of the ocean, what we're taking out of the natural systems on the land. We, like every other creature who lives, we use the natural world. Birds do it. They take twigs and make nests. They eat their neighbors. <laughs> All creatures survive as a part of a network of life. And we are just the same in that respect. But in many ways, there's never been a creature such as humans who have so consumed the elements of what makes life possible for all forms of life. We're really good at deploying our enhanced technologies, our enhanced capabilities through technologies to be able to level forests, to strip the ocean of life, to poison the waters, to do whatever it is that we've done that have altered the nature of nature in a few decades, unraveled systems that have been hundreds of millions of years in the making, eliminated swaths of life, not just individual species, but entire ecosystems gone from this fabric, this, this computer system, if you will, upon which we're all reliant for our existence. Now we know. I, I tell kids to cheer up, or anybody who cares to listen, cheer up. We're armed with knowledge. Now we know. You might not care, even if you know. But you can't care if you don't know. And in the past, even in, when I was a kid, we made policies, had this idea that the world, the ocean, huh, it's too big to fail. Nothing puny humans can do can change things. But here we are. Now we know. And this is why, as never before, maybe as never again, we've got a chance to take whatever actions 
need to be taken, armed with knowing. We don't know it all, for heaven's sakes, and that's fun. That's the good thing. We're, we should be have a sense of humility about the magnitude of our ignorance, but we know enough to know, we can see enough to see that we're heading in a bad direction owing to what we have done to our life support system. And it's not too late for the most part. It may be too late for a lot of things, but not too late to make things better than they otherwise would be if we just continue on the track that we're now going. So that's the beginning, the middle, and kind of the conclusion of what I want to say, but I'll round it out a bit with a few more images. <laughs> like this one. Again, not an image that was possible when I was a kid, <clears throat> but here we are, early in the 21st century, able to look for the possibility that we can terraform Mars, make Mars more Earth-like, and maybe make it an outpost for human civilization. It's a great dream, and it, it, it might happen if we keep our act together here on the little blue one on the left. But just think about it. If you've seen the film The Martian, or even if you haven't, just think about what would it take to survive on Mars? Well, first, it's mostly an atmosphere of carbon dioxide. We need carbon dioxide to power photosynthesis, along with water, of course, and chlorophyll. And, you know, we need those wonderful green things that generate oxygen and take up carbon dioxide and make animal life possible. Huh. So, ironically, while we're really trying very hard to think how we can live on Mars, I and mean, we're investing a lot of our intelligence and our resources to be able to solve that problem because it's, it's intriguing. <laughs> you go sit on the red planet and camp out. Maybe even have populations reproducing up there, not seven billion people, or let alone nine or 10, but while we're doing that, terraforming Mars, we're mars forming Earth. We're putting more carbon dioxide into our atmosphere. We're eliminating the very elements that make our life possible while we're looking to make life more possible somewhere else. It's, it's a little bizarre when you think about it. There it is, our home planet. In the news right now, headlines about what's happening to a very special place in the ocean, the Great Barrier Reef off the east coast of Australia. I started visiting there in the 1970s when it looked pretty much like the images that you're seeing now. These wondrous, complicated, amazing systems of life. It's like looking at the cross-section of life on Earth when you look at a coral reef because most of the major categories of animals are there, and many of the plants as well. There are 30, maybe 35 of the major divisions of animal life. They're all essentially, one way or the other, in the ocean. And only about half occur on the land. Most people think of animals as cats and dogs and horses, and maybe they'll remember that fish are animals, but generally speaking, animals to most people are not what I think of as animals. I think of, of corals and copepods and <laughs> anemones and the, just this galaxy of little creatures that make up the what some refer to as the, the nuts, the bolts, the cogs, the wheels that hold the planet together. These amazing forms of life that are out in the ocean, only in the ocean, shaping the chemistry, the character, the nature of the ocean, and therefore the nature of life on Earth. Well, a couple of years ago, I got to go back to the Coral Sea and the Great Barrier Reef. And this is what I found, not everywhere, but over large sections of that wondrous system that extends over more than a thousand miles along the eastern seaboard of Australia. Things have changed, why? Well, it's a combination. And, and it just is a showcase, if you will, of what's happening globally, in co especially in coastal areas, but everywhere. The chemistry of the water 
itself is changing. It's warmer, powered by the carbon dioxide that we're putting into the atmosphere, warming the planet, warming the ocean to a level that is unfriendly to many of the creatures that live within a fairly narrow band of temperature tolerance. Too warm for too long cause, causes corals to lose their important partners, the algae that live within the tissues. And they bleach, they go snowy white, and it looks kind of beautiful in a way. Huh, an ivory ocean. But it's terrible news for the corals and for the life that is there. It's bad news for us too. And the latest news from the Great Barrier Reef just in recent weeks is that in the northern part at least, on the order of 93% has turned like this, gone white. It's not just the warming, and it's not just the effect of excess carbon dioxide, not just warming the planet, but acidifying the ocean. It's not good for the corals. It's not good for the other creatures dependent on a chemistry that's been fairly stable for a very long time. You suddenly have this shift in pH. But it's more than that. The Great Barrier Reef, although in recent years, as much as 33% of the Great Barrier Reef has been fully protected. 67% is still open to, to fishing, including commercial fishing. And yes, there are rules and regulations, but it's still being stripped of wildlife. Well, coral reefs need the fish. The fish need coral reefs. You take the fish away, it stresses the corals. You take the corals away, of course, where's the home for the fish that live typically amount around coral reefs? Well, that's one thing. And then there's also the effect of what we're putting into the ocean from the land. The agriculture that is extensive on the eastern seaboard of Australia, but look around the world. What we put on the land, the fertilizer to grow crops, the pesticides, the herbicides, all the other stuff that we have developed and applied to suit us is being ultimately leached out into the ocean. And it has an impact. And we can look at it and see it and measure it in ways that we couldn't do before. So now we know. We can see the consequences of our actions. And even the economist, you think, what's the economist doing? Thinking about the environment and putting it on the balance sheet. Well, it seems, when you think about it, the logical thing, because the economy upon which the world functions is totally dependent on the sound environment. You strip the ingredients of the planet away, what's, what, what is there that an economy can, can, how can we function without the, the natural systems that make everything possible for us, our lives themselves? So great interest in the part of industry, the business, the good business minds, the leaders that gather at Davos every year, increasingly are looking at what are we doing to the natural world? Everyone now in the 21st century has access to the knowledge that things are changing at a rate that is unprecedented in all of human history by our hand. What we're doing is altering the nature of nature. Bad news, you'd think. I mean, altering the nature of nature is not in itself bad news. We've altered the nature of nature to develop the technologies that have given us our prosperity. We've drilled down into the earth to take the fossilized photosynthesis, the products of photosynthesis, we fossil fuels, coal, oil, gas, and powered our way to where we are. And it, it's been a huge gift to move from where we were in the middle of the 20th century to where we are now because of the energy that we applied to solving the questions that we answer. But the greatest thing that we have gained from burning through all those assets, those hundreds of millions of years of assets that we've released to power our prosperity, it's given us the gift of knowing. Putting rockets up in the sky, you can't do that on whale oil. We've done it by harnessing fossil fuels. <laughs> the communication system that we all enjoy, where did it come from? How is it powered? How is it that we move around the way we do with airplanes? You know, it's all fossil fuels. 
We, we have a society, a structure, a civilization that is powered by our appetite for this, what it's one point in our life, and some people still kind of think of it as this endless source of energy. But of course it's not. We know that, we can see it, and we can see the consequences, the downside of burning fossil fuels. Now we know. That's a gift that burning fossil fuels has given us, that we have to change our ways. We have to, if we are to have prosperity in the future. Not just for 7 billion people, but even a smaller number, let alone a larger number. We have to stop shaking the underpinnings of what keeps the planet hospitable for us. And we need to restore the damage that we've done protect what remains of the systems that hold the planet steady. So measuring polar ice has really been something that is new in our time. Able to look from high in the sky and actually define it, measure it. Hard to do when you're just on the ground level, but enhanced by our capacity to look at the whole world with new eyes and to see the downside, not just the burning fossil fuels, but the consequences of, well, extracting them. There will be accidents, there have been, there will be, with a terrible cost to the areas immediately around where spills such as the Deepwater Horizon spill in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010, not just huge cost in human lives lost, but the impact on the ocean itself that continues to have impacts it's so great, in a way, to have these lights <laughs> anytime we want them, day and night. But when you think about it, humans existed and prospered long before Earth looked like this at night. And there's a downside to illuminating the planet on such a scale. But let's say, okay, we want to have a planet that looks like this at night. We have the means, we have the intelligence, we have the capacity to power civilization with other means that are more friendly to the environment and therefore <laughs> better for us. We see the consequences of our actions in more storms, more intense storms. We can see what the future might be, not just for polar bears with diminishing ice, but the consequences to us and not just those of us who live near a shoreline where the ocean continues to rise and storms and storm surges continue to intensify. And it's not just the other kind of <coughs> oil spill that we have to think about. It's the oil invested in the products, plastics, that now flood the world in ways that are new to our time. I personally come from the pre-plasticozoic. Maybe some of the rest of you do too in a childhood where there weren't any plastic cups or spoons or, or little bags that you use once and throw it away. We now know <laughs> that this is not such a good idea, although it seemed like a good idea at the time. So convenient, but now so terrible for all that follows. How do we get rid of them once they're in the ocean? Well, we know how to get rid of some things by extracting with huge nets and thousands of miles of baited hooks in the ocean that are taking from the ocean. At the same time that we're putting things into the ocean, putting things into the living world, we're really good now armed with technologies that enable us to find and capture and kill and market ocean wildlife on an unprecedented scale. Never before in history has there been a species capable of consuming so much of the rest of the living world in just a few years. When I was a kid, again, if you take that as a starting point, we all kind of think of when we arrived, that's how the world has always been. But certainly, the changes that have taken place since I arrived have been shockingly swift and dramatic. I thought my parents lived through a time of unprecedented change, and they did at the time. My father was born in 1900. My mother came along in 1902. I mean, before there were cars and spacecraft and all of that, 
And they were still walking to school, horse and buggy, and saw airplanes and cars, and, and, and this amazing transformation in the 20th century. But consider what's happened just in the last 20 years. I mean, I couldn't imagine a phone that you could walk around with or put in your pocket when I was a kid. It's just impossible. The things that we now take for granted and kids grow up with, the ability to connect so readily with people and with information around the world, it's truly a gift. And when I arrived, taking that point and looking at myself as, as a young oceanographer, diving into the ocean for the first time in the 1950s, fish populations around the world were, were taking about 20 million tons a year. Now it's closer to 100 million tons a year. The populations were generally healthy, but now we see 90% decline in that time, most of it since the 1970s. You know, we've gradually been able to erode away these immense populations of ocean wildlife with t technologies that now enable us to do what was impossible to imagine not so long ago. Sharks. <laughs> when I started as, as a, you know, being a diver in the ocean, I was told that Watch out for the sharks. There are man-eaters out there. And then I realized, I don't qualify. I, I, you know, my guys, friends, probably, they have to watch out. But mm, mm. Turns out that whether you're a man or a woman, sharks don't like to eat us. We're not on their menu, but they are certainly on ours. Hundreds, millions of sharks have been extracted from the ocean and are continuing to be extracted for shark fins, just for a luxury taste of, of soup. And it, it's not particularly special taste, it just is a, an acquired taste. that We've taught ourselves to think that this is something really special. What have the sharks ever done to us? Not much. I don't believe Jaws. <laughs> We're, we, few people get munched on every once in a while in the ocean. A lot more of us in the ocean today than there ever were in times past. But if they really wanted to go after us, it would, we wouldn't want to go into the sea. If they, if we treated, if they treated us the way we treat them, <laughs> nobody would ever get close to the ocean, <laughs> because we go after them with such force, reducing their numbers to the estimates are something like ten percent of the big sharks remain from when I began exploring the ocean. Sharks have a lot to fear from us, so do swordfish and tunas, and even the little guys like menhaden that once were extremely abundant and extremely important to the nature of life in the sea. I visited Chesapeake Bay in 2012 to look at the ocean from the standpoint of the little fish Menhaden, um, bunkers they're called in some parts of the world. They feed on the low part of the food chain. They gobble up phytoplankton, little zooplankton along with that, but mostly they're filter feeding at the low end of the food chain. Sunlight, phytoplankton plants, and then you get the little fish that are consumed by birds, consumed by tunas, consumed by whales and sharks, they're critical elements in food chains. But they had nothing in their history that prepared them for humans as predators. We use aircraft to find them, boats with nets that circle entire schools. So menhaden, little fish, not just the big fish, not just sharks and tunas and cod and halibut and swordfish and all of those other things that appear in markets, but their numbers too have gone from here down to a tiny fraction of what were around in the 1950s. So, what's the impact on the ocean? Imagine being a fish. You know, we, we wouldn't do that to chickens. Well, maybe we would, but basically, you don't think of fish as, as things that we should care about. They're products in the minds of many. They're things that we just use as commodities or as sources of food. But as a scientist, as a biologist, as a diver, someone who's had a chance to spend 
thousands of hours underwater getting to know fish face to face, getting to know individuals. It's made a difference in, in the way I look at fish. I see them as living creatures like cats and dogs and horses and even people. They have, they feel pain. They, they uh, want to live. And what we do to them without thinking it matters how we treat them, it's, <laughs> use the word inhumane. <laughs> but I don't know, of course we have to eat, but we do not have to eat ocean wildlife on the scale that we are now attempting to extract. By doing so, we are fostering the decline of the ocean systems that give us a whole lot more than pounds of meat. The most important thing that we do extract from the ocean is our existence. And by large scale, industrial scale extraction that feeds luxury tastes, not needs, some people need to rely on fish, ocean wildlife, for their sustenance. But for the most part, what we're taking feeds a big industry that is marketing, marketed for the benefit of those entities that live off of the wildlife extracted from the ocean. So think about what we did with whales. They used to be the source of big income and not always a real need, although it did provide illumination. Whale oil was important in part of our history. We kind of gave it up as we began to find and extract fossil fuels. And, but put that aside. Whales have still been used as commodities. We had this habit of consuming whales right up through the middle and toward the end of the 20th century. 1966 in California was still was a time when the last whaling station closed in California. Um, <laughs> Richmond and Monterey still killing humpback whales well into the 20th century. But then we stopped because it was clear. We had the evidence. We could see. We were measuring, looking at the value of whales alive as well as the value of whales dead. And you look at the balance sheet. Whale watching is an industry today that is like this. And when you look at the value of dead whales, it doesn't compare. You can use a dead whale once to sell the products, but you can use a live whale looking at it just as the economist might look at the value of a whale, but there's more. Whales are a part of the system that has developed over all preceding history, whales the, and dolphins, their mammalian cousins, and, and other creatures. They're all a part of a system, and when a whale munches on little fish, menhaden, or krill, or whatever it is that the whales scoop up when they, when they eat, they also give nutrients back into the ocean that powers the phytoplankton, that powers the zooplankton that powers the little fish that feed the whales. It's a cycle that goes round and round and round. It's the way the world has worked through the ages. We're all in this together. There's a place for everybody that you take, but you also give back. You take, you give back. You take, you give back. And the world rolls on. But humans have come along, and we have taken way more than any creature ever in, in the history of, of the planet and disrupted these fine-tuned systems but now we know. And that's the great news, the ability to look at a tuna and think about more than sushi or sashimi or sandwiches or casseroles or whatever it is, however you think of tuna. And there are a number of variations on the theme of tuna. The altissimo tuna is probably the bluefin, the one that commands the highest price in markets around the world. It's a learned taste. It's not a necessity. But I think we need tunas in the ocean. We don't need them on our plates. We need them as a part of these fine-tuned ecosystems. And it may just be too late to save tunas in some parts of the world, in the Pacific, where we're still extracting them at high levels and a high price. And one tuna sold for $1.8 million, one tuna, because of the high price that could be gained for them in special restaurant offerings. But you can't make a tuna or anything else, no matter how much money we invest in trying to replicate a tuna. <laughs> what would it take to make a tuna from scratch? Oh, we're not there yet. Maybe never. Meanwhile, 
we're losing the source. 4% remain, according to the latest calculations, in the Pacific since the 1970s. If you take that as a starting point from then to now, losing 94% and we're still killing them. We try to do it sustainably so that we can continue to supply the markets, the taste that has been acquired in recent decades, mostly post-World War II. Ah, I could go on. <laughs> But I'd like to dive back in to looking at the little guys that power much of the action in the ocean and therefore the world because with every breath you take, you're connected to the little guys in the ocean that generate more than half of the oxygen. It wasn't until 1986 that one particular kind called Prochlorococcus was discovered by a young woman, oceanographer at MIT, Penny Chisholm, wasn't even looking for this powerful little m m mighty microbe that does so much of the heavy lifting and generating oxygen and taking up carbon in the oceans of the world. Many variations on the theme of Prochlorococcus, but the discovery of its existence that it escaped the nets, the probes, the microfilters and things before a new technique was applied, and now we know that maybe as much as 20% of the oxygen in the atmosphere is generated by this tiny little beast alone. You cannot see them in the picture on the screen right now because they're so small. They're so small we couldn't find them until we had the technology that made it possible to discover their existence and then to evaluate their role back to us. So here we are observing food chains in action. And it's really important when you're doing this not to become a part of the food chain yourself, but to realize it's sunlight powering the micro plants and some of the big plants too, the seaweeds, my specialty. We should thank them for our existence because that's the way it is, the way you thank your heart. Thank you, heart. I exist because you do your job. Thank you, little guys in the ocean for doing your job that makes my existence possible. It's fantastic to be a witness to this now. And any of you really have the capacity to do this, should you choose to put on a mask and fins, go look at the blue part of the planet. My mother waited until she was 81 to do it, and then she scolded me afterwards. Why didn't you get me in the ocean sooner? It's so beautiful. And she got to see fish swimming in something other than lemon slices and butter for the first time. Well, she'd been to aquariums and all that, but I mean, out in the ocean. And she knew and really applauded, as my father did as well, the idea of turning me loose, letting me go out and explore the ocean, living underwater. I've done it now on 10 different occasions where you actually use the ocean as a laboratory, like the space station up in the sky, but the astronauts who get to actually walk in space and be out in the, that amazing huh, universe where there aren't any fish um, up there in the sky, as compared to those of us who've had a chance to actually dive in to the ocean and live underwater for days and weeks at a time, we have access through a hole in the floor that like the best swimming pool ever. And pressure on the inside keeps water from bubbling in and we can just step in and out any time and go explore the ocean around and get to know the fish on their own terms, get to see what life is like. In you know, we have a habit as scientists of taking pieces of nature and bringing it into the laboratory and doing all kinds of things to control circumstances so we can really discover the nature of life, who we are, where we've come from by looking at the nature of, of our fellow creatures, of, of our own selves. And it's really given us tremendous insight into those big questions. But getting into a natural forest and just quietly looking, observing, doing what scientists really do, observe carefully, Report honestly what you see. 
whether you're manipulating the creatures and, and your laboratory or whatever it is, or you're just looking at the way things exist around you, you observe carefully, you report honestly what you see, and you contribute to the body of knowledge that moves civilization forward. And anybody can do it. You don't have to have a white coat and a lab and a big title to indicate that you are a scientist. Any little kid can do what a scientist does, and you can do it all your life. Observe carefully, report honestly, learn how to discriminate truth from fiction, and embrace the natural world with a sense of ah, respect. So, I spend a lot of time listening to the fish. <laughs> fish do make sounds, like birds, like whales, like lobsters, like shrimp, most creatures. You can even hear a snail crawling along ground if you listen with an enhanced capacity to hear. It's the whole world <laughs> makes sounds, but some make deliberate sounds that are used to communicate with their fellows around. And we're just beginning to tune in, to listen to nature with a sensitivity that perhaps existed 10,000 years ago when we were much more closely connected to the world, the living world, and our survival was more directly and more obviously connected to respecting life around us. But what's changed is our enhanced ability to understand what it all means and to understand why Maury eels deserve our immense respect. They're amazing creatures if you really get to know them. And there's nothing in their history that causes them to want to attack us. Why do we have it in for them? <laughs> They're not after us. We, most of nature would be just as happy to let us be part of the system, just as you go into a coral reef, you see sharks swimming with parrotfish, and sometimes a parrotfish will be consumed by a shark, but mostly they're, it's like a peaceful kingdom with rare exceptions, and most of those exceptions are when we arrive on the scene. Oh, so, wonderful creatures, like stomatopods, <laughs> mantis shrimp with the most extraordinary eyes of any animals. We see a spectrum of light that, you know, is like this compared to theirs. Wouldn't you love to be able to see what a stomatopod sees? Huh? A mantis shrimp? Well, anyway. You go through the whole animal kingdom. What do octopuses know that we can't know because we are not in a body such as theirs? What, what is it about the biggest fish in the sea that enables them to travel over long distances, whale sharks, and know exactly the right time to appear when the tuna are spawning so they can open their big mouths and engulf them? It's wonderful to have the level of knowing what we now know and mostly appreciation, growing appreciation for what we don't know and the importance of continuing to foster the technologies that will take us not just high in the sky but deep in the ocean. I sort of took a sidetrack from my focused career as a scientist to team up with engineers to try to Solve the problem. Okay, as a diver, I can go down to 50 feet, 100 feet, sometimes tiptoe down to 200 feet, even 250 feet with long decompressions out in the open ocean to allow the nitrogen in my system to escape so I can safely go back to the surface. And I have a very limited passport to be able to even get a glimpse of what's down in the depths below, even to a couple of hundred feet. The average depth of the ocean is two and a half miles. The maximum is seven miles. And we're we're just beginning to develop the technologies now, early in the 21st century, to give us access to the sea, not just for a handful of scientists, but for anybody, anywhere who wants to go and check out what the ocean is like. I want to see my planet, my blue planet, from the inside out. So you can package yourself in a little submarine, you can send your presence remotely with robots. Didn't exist before the 1980s. The ability to send our eyes and ears and cameras and manipulator arms into the depths below. How long have humans been around? And how recently have we accessed the sea with the ability 
to understand what's going on in the part of the planet that drives climate and weather, shapes planetary chemistry, shapes the temperature, holds most of life on Earth, the greatest diversity of life on Earth, the ocean. What do we know? We know enough to know that it's changing and that we're the agents of change. But imagine, in the image here, these are the only two vehicles that have ever been developed that have made it possible for people, real live human beings, to personally go to the deepest part of the ocean, seven miles down. Seven miles is a long way if you're holding your breath. But imagine how many people have gone seven miles up when we were talking millions and millions fly, watching movies, eating lunch, taking naps, seven miles walk, careening through the sky, and only three people in all of our history. Two in 1960 in that cigar-shaped device, the little ball beneath where Don Walsh and Jacques Picard crouched looking through a tiny little porthole to see what life was like seven miles down. And they stayed for about half an hour and were able then to go back to the surface. And that little green thing on the right is the system developed and personally funded for the most part by the people most people think of as a filmmaker, an artist, uh, James Cameron, who is also basically a scientist, observes carefully, report honest, reports honestly, tells stories that tell the truth <laughs> through his films, but he is also inherently a very savvy engineer and worked with other engineers to develop that capsule-like thing that plummeted down to full ocean depth 2012, became the first person to go solo to the deepest part of the ocean, and only the third person in history to glimpse what it was like at the bottom of the Mariana Trench. He's a messenger. He's a witness. We're all messengers. We're all witnesses to an unprecedented time in history. One of the companies that I had the pleasure of starting, the most recent one, now really run by my daughter and son-in-law, built a manipulator arm that was on the system that James Cameron took to the deepest part of of the ocean. A little piece of California went to the bottom of the Mariana Trench and came back when James Cameron came back. So it's the joy of being a part of history, a part of making a difference at this critical point in history, this time of the greatest discovery, the greatest opportunity that any, any have ever had in all of history to make a difference, to be able to explore and see the oldest living things that we know about on Earth among animals, the deep sea corals that we know by looking at the structure and dating their age more than 5,000 years old, some thought to be maybe as old as 9,000 years, individual trees of coral in the deep sea. So the cool thing is, as a scientist, in a submarine so simple to drive that even a scientist can do it, and to be able to explore and to anticipate the next step, new submersibles that anybody can really go in and explore. It's right on the horizon. We're just beginning to see, like early in the 20th century, flight began to become embraced as, as a kind of a, not just a sometimes exotic thing, but who doesn't want to be able to go high in the sky? Who should not want to go down into the depths of the ocean to be a witness to what's there, to get to know the creatures in the ocean and to see ourselves, to see what we're doing? to make a plan that gives us hope for whatever the future will be. Plenty of reason for hope. In Hong Kong, not long ago, I saw what the kids in Hong Kong were thinking about sharks. This is a city where you can buy just about any kind of endangered species that your little heart desires, and shark fins have been a common commodity, openly available, almost not just in the restaurants, but you can buy your own stock of shark fins in many places in Hong Kong. But the kids, we love sharks. We want to take care of sharks. They're out there celebrating their existence, not their demise. Kids, armed, working with Noah, going out to the northwestern Hawaiian Islands, extracting the debris, some of those discarded nets that are clogging the ocean, 
and keep killing long after they have been set adrift in the ocean. Recovering them, turning them into perhaps a polar fleece near you, who knows, at least disposing of them in places where they can do little harm going forward. Plenty of reason for hope. Jane Goodall says, it's the human mind. Clever people, humans, primates that we are, we do have something special going for us. It's not just our minds, it's our social structure that enables the distillation of individual minds to gather and pass the word along one generation to the next, one generation to the next. So here we are, as never before, armed with knowing what our ancestors have discovered and made available to us, one way or the other. Another reason she has cause for hope is the human spirit that goes beyond just facts and figures and looking at evidence. And it, We're doing something about it. We're inspired to want to have a better life. Whatever it is that you think of as the human spirit coupled with the resilience of nature. We have done terrible things around the world, to the world, and yet we can still breathe. Rain still magically falls out of the sky. We still have going to the Galapagos Islands, most of the creatures that were there when Charles Darwin visited there in the middle of the 1800s. Their numbers are greatly down, especially in the ocean. Very few sharks as compared to what there were. The sea cucumbers have gone to market, mostly in Asia. The lobsters make their way into US markets as well as elsewhere in the world. Many of the fish go straight to the mainland, to Ecuador, but also get exported, especially the tunas globally. So this treasure of, <laughs> of, of science, the Galapagos Islands, it's been stripped in the ocean. 97% of the land protected, 3% open for people to live and do their thing. It's not perfect, a lot of introduced species, and yes, there's an impact on the 97% that's protected, but the ocean, is. some of it is technically protected, but it's still wide open for exploitation. A lot of small users lead to a large impact on a vulnerable system. So the sharks are greatly depleted. It's hard to find a big grouper there anymore. But reasons for hope. Just this year, Ecuador has taken action so that two of the small islands that have a big ocean area of jurisdiction around them have been protected. That is, like the land, on the land you are not allowed to kill the boobies, you can't step on the iguanas. Uh, it'd be bad news for you if you tried to kidnap a penguin and take it away. But the ocean has been sort of wide open until now. A huge area has been set aside for protection, a move in the right direction. It's not complete by any means. But around the world, action is being taken. Choices are being made in favor of a sustainable future, perhaps, for humankind. Places identified that are being referred to in a project called Mission Blue as hope spots. Places such as on the land we have embraced with care, we call them national parks. This is the 100th anniversary of establishing national parks in the United States, an idea that has caught on around the world. Is it the best idea America ever had? Well, it's certainly a good idea, and now it's an even equally good idea to extend into the ocean. As president, presidents really since Kennedy in the ocean with the first blue park in the Virgin Islands, a little place, but an important place because it's like diving 50 years ago when you go to that small protected area in the Virgin Buck Island. Nearby, it's, huh, again, ghost towns everywhere. Protection works, hope spots, places that if we protect them now, restore places that are depleted, like the waters right here off New York. Let's put some oysters back, not for eating them, but to let oysters be oysters and do their job of filtering the water. Chesapeake Bay is a hope spot, a hope spot. Not because it's pristine and beautiful, but it could be better than it is if we work together to restore health. And there are places 
little island nation of Palau. It's a big blue hoop spot. And we are just on the edge of a time when individuals such as the president of Palau looks at the assets, the big blue ocean around the little tiny island home, and saying, we have the authority to protect. We can continue to open it up to killing, or we can initiate an era of caring. What a concept. Restore what's been lost, protect what exists. Tourism in Palau is an industry this big as compared to fishing that is this big. It's a no-brainer. The same is true, though, in the Galapagos Islands. Tourism, the revenue for Ecuador and for the island nation itself, is huge as compared to the revenue generated by extracting wildlife for markets. It's an observation, something any of us can do. Look at the evidence. Consider our values. In 2012, in Rio, at the conference that is this World Sustainability Conference that happens every 10 years, the headline was, what is the world we want? The world we want. And we should think about that every day. What's the world we want? The decisions I make right now will determine, <laughs> one way or the other, what the world will be. We all have power. Some have more than others. President Ramingasel in Palau has the power to influence the establishment of 80% of the exclusive economic zone of his country. President Obama, using the Antiquities Act, used his power two years ago to establish the biggest area then declared in the ocean for protection among some of the western parts of US assets in the Pacific. Chile protected the waters around Easter Island. The UK, looking at Pitcairn Island, small population, a little bit of land, a lot of ocean, now protected. So that a year ago, these initiatives for the ocean amounted to about 1% of the ocean, where even the fish were safe. Safe havens for tunas and turtles and swordfish and sharks and, and our life support system. Now, this year, right now, as we sit here, it's 2%. We've doubled the amount of ocean in one year that is under protection. It's a move in the right direction. Will it stay at that level? I don't think so. I think that people are beginning to value the ocean, see fish, see the ocean, see the world, see the importance of protecting nature with new eyes, new sense of urgency. We can see our life support system unraveling around us, but it isn't too late to do what we can to double again the amount of land and sea that we put in the bank, protect and, and keep it as a reserve. We will use the natural world, all creatures do, but we've gone so far overboard, so fast, we must give nature a break. Ed Wilson, one of my heroes, celebrated his 80th birthday here at the World Science Festival a few years ago. And he brought people to tears with his urgent commentary on how we're letting nature slip through our fingers. And here we are. We're still letting that happen. But now we see the other side. Nature is letting us slip through hers. We can destroy the very underpinnings of what makes our existence possible. Huh? We've been doing it without even thinking about it, but now we know. Cause for hope. As never before, this is the time to be a human being on planet Earth. Maybe as never again. Thank you. <laughs>